everybody's uh, here uh, and uh, welcome to the last grade books um, session and i uh, hope you are all well and uh, i'm sure that uh, you're looking forward to the festive season and uh, taking some break uh, after this very challenging uh, year so uh, since our last discussion i went into uh, researching that uh, how people uh, were influenced by simon de beauvoir's uh, work and uh, what really has uh, has happened or transpired uh, since uh, she published uh, her book and it was quite an interesting um, uh, exercise to really look into that uh, uh, what were the different reviews and arguments for uh, for her book and how actually her work resonates um, to today so i prepared a little uh, slideshow um, different as it was last time so i'd like to ask rick to uh, to start that one and I'm gonna go to my uh, to my notes. Uh, so how and in what ways Simone de Beauvoir legacy and her political philosophy resonates today? So that's the theme for today. She said, one is not born a woman, one becomes a woman. In 1949, Simone de Beauvoir wrote these words in her groundbreaking work, The Second Sex, and sparked the revolution. Exploring the roles that biology, history, and literature have played in creating and upholding the myth of woman, she plotted how this transformation takes place from birth through old age, and she challenged us to imagine what a free woman's life might be like. In doing so, she initiated the second wave of feminism. Now, 70 years later, what has remained the same and what has changed in the lives of women and men? Have we reached that day Beauvoir envisioned when she said, it will be possible for woman to love not in her weakness, but in strength, not to escape herself, but to find herself, not to abase herself, but to assert herself. The world has witnessed dramatic changes in the past years. What would Beauvoir think of the rise of the Me Too movement? What might she have to say about society's continued struggle for equal pay, for equal work? What insights might she have to offer about the representation of women in social media? Now, here are some reflections of Sky Cleary, who teaches at Columbia University. A less well-known facet of her philosophy, particularly relevant today, is her political activism, a viewpoint that follows directly from her metaphysical stance on the self, namely that we have no fixed essences. The existential maxim, existence precedes essence, underpins Beauvoir's philosophy. For her, as for Jean-Paul Sartre, we are first thrown into the world and then create our being through our actions. While there are facts of our existence that we cannot choose, such as being born, who our parents were, and our genetic inheritance, we shouldn't use our biology or history as excuses not to act. The existential goal is to be an agent, to take control over our life actively, transcending the facts of our existence by pursuing self-chosen goals. It is easy to find excuses not to act, so easy that many of us spend much of our lives doing so. Many of us believe that we don't have free will, even as some neuroscientists are discovering that our conscious will can override our impulses. We tell ourselves that our vote won't make any difference instead of actively shaping the world in which we want to live. We point fingers at Facebook for facilitating fake news instead of critically assessing what we are reading and reposting. 
It is not just lazy to push away responsibility in such ways, but it is what Beauvoir called a moral fault. Since we are all affected by politics, if we choose not to be involved in creating the conditions of our own lives, this reduces us to what Beauvoir called absurd vegetation. It is tantamount to rejecting existence. We must take a side. The problem is, it is not always clear which side we ought to choose. Even Beauvoir failed to navigate through this question safely. She adopted questionable political stances. She once, for example, dismissed Chairman Mao, responsible for the murder of over 45 million people, as being no more dictatorial than Franklin D. Roosevelt. Beauvoir's philosophy of political commitment has a dark side, and she personally made some grave errors of judgment, yet within her philosophy, there is an opening to address this issue. In the Ethics of Ambiguity, published in 1947, she argues that to be free is to be able to stretch ourselves into an open future full of possibilities. Having this kind of freedom may be dizzying, but it doesn't mean we get to do whatever we like. We share the earth and have concern for one another. If we respect freedom for ourselves, then we should respect it for others too. Using our freedom to exploit and oppress others or to support the side that promotes such policies is inconsistent with this radical existential freedom. With oppressive regimes, Beauvoir acknowledged that individuals usually pay a high price for standing up to dictators and the tyranny of the majority, but demonstrated concretely through her writing and political engagement, the power of collective action to bring about structural change. An intellectual vigilant, Beauvoir used her pen as a weapon, breaking down gendered stereotypes and challenging laws that prohibited women from having control over their own bodies. She authored and signed the Manifesto of 343 in 1971, which paved the way for birth control and abortion in France. Today, more than ever, it is vital to recognize that freedom cannot be assumed. Some of the freedoms that Beauvoir fought so hard for in the mid 20th century have since come under threat. Beauvoir warns, that we should expect appeals to nature and utility to be used as justifications for restrictions on our freedom. And she has been proved correct. For example, the argument that Donald Trump and others have used that pregnancy is inconvenient for businesses is an implicit way of communicating the view that it is natural and economical for women to be baby-making machines while men work. However, Beauvoir points out, anatomy and hormones never defined anything but a situation. And making birth control, abortion, and parental leave unavailable closes down men's and women's ability to reach beyond their given situation, reinforcing stereotypical roles that keep women chained to unpaid home labor and men on a treadmill of paid labor. In times of political turmoil, one may feel overwhelmed with anxiety and can even be tempted with Sartre to think that hell is other people. Beauvoir encourages us to consider that others also give us the word because they infuse it with meaning. We can only make sense of ourselves in relation to others and can only make sense of the world around us by understanding others' goals. We strive to understand our differences and to embrace the tension between us. World peace is a stretch, since we don't all choose the same goals, but we can still look for ways to create solidarity, such as by working to agitate authoritarians, to revolt against tyrants, to amplify marginalized voices, to abolish oppression. Persistence is essential since, as Beauvoir says, 
one's life has value so long as one attributes value to the life of others by means of love, friendship, indignation, and compassion. Beauvoir is surely right that this is the risk, the anguish, and the beauty of human existence. Today, the importance of contemporary feminism is particularly pertinent worldwide in the need to address issues of the gender pay gap, sexual harassment in the workplace and beyond, racial discrimination, and attacks upon a person's right to sexual freedom. This becomes clear at the most basic level when elected politicians and world leaders continue to fall short in addressing these issues. While feminist and equal rights activists may not directly credit Beauvoir or protest with her in mind, her role remains undeniable in the initial motivation of international feminist movement today. Can we have the second slide, please, Derek? I read um, an interesting um, observation reflection of a PhD student by Morgorzata Durigin in connection uh, with the pandemic and Beauvoir's work. Beauvoir wrote her fundamental work on women 70 years ago. It was a period of transition that she welcomed with hope, even though she stated that in no country was women's status was equal to men's, she noticed that the situation for women was improving, at least in the Western world. She also praised the situation of women in the Soviet Union, as she enthusiastically reported on the promised revolutionary changes in the form of a country's social support for working mothers. Years later, and just recently, we have had the misfortune to enter another time of transition. The pandemic of COVID-19 significantly changes the situation for women. Beauvoir states that when society is reorganized, she is rigidly enslaved again. And maybe this is the case that women who will suffer more, both socially and economically due to the pandemic. Women are at a considerable disadvantage again in a man's world with limited opportunities outside the home. If they are lucky not to lose jobs now, they most perform low paid or part-time work. With school closures and the shift to virtual learning, they are the ones who usually give up their plans to engage in child caring and homeschooling practices. Women are expected now to take care not only of children and the elderly, but also of their sick partners. Where they are already responsible for housekeeping, they may now also assist their partners, who are sometimes the only breadwinners in their home office work. As already known from history, in many cases, their support is overlooked or suppressed, and it is mostly men who are credited and paid for the work. The pandemic has worsened the situation of women from minoritized groups, especially from Black and Latin communities, as they increasingly struggle with food and housing insecurity and limited access to healthcare, childcare, and other services. Further, the COVID-19 pandemic has made the personal and economic precarity of many migrant and refugee women increasingly visible particularly due to their own or family member status as undocumented or displaced and to cruel family immigrant separation policies. Erundati Roy in 2020 write, wrote the following, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal a gateway between one world and the next. Unfortunately, it seems that across the world, women's independence will be a silent victim of the pandemic. Unless we dare to break up with the past and build a new status quo, instead of returning to the normalcy of gender inequality and schools reproducing the society as we know it, 
and replicating the patriarchal structure of the family in the world before the pandemic. 70 years ago, when commenting on another period of transition, Beauvoir wrote, what determines women's present situation is the stubborn survival of the most ancient traditions in the new emerging civilization. The new reality after COVID-19 pandemic should be created from the feminist perspective, which calls for social and educational change. Even though the condition of women has improved today than what Beauvoir has described at that time, there is still richness in the second sex and is still relevant today after decades because it reminds us of the still prevailing discrepancies in modern society. We have reached a point where the term feminism has become more confusing than ever. Some women and men believe that the struggle has come to an end. Others believe that gender inequality is simply not here anymore. However, people are claiming that nothing is over, that we have a long way to go. What is however worrying is that people tend to associate feminism with man-hating. The second sex offers a solution in a style of back to basics. Whenever we are stuck in a problem, we tend to look at it from the beginning. In this case, the second sex serves as the root to which we should appeal for help. To understand the sex-related problems of our society, we should look back to the point it all started. Simone de Beauvoir offers you this chance through her masterpiece. Now, for the remaining of uh, our time together, I'd like to uh, share a special interview I made with a super lovely special person by the name of uh, Brenda Crowther. And um, I was, she's my dear friend, uh, and also she teaches at uh, Ubiquiti University. Uh, you may have taken uh, uh, some of her courses already in the past. Uh, I was talking with her a couple of months ago, and uh, I asked her about how she, she, she experienced herself when she first read the book, and then what has she seen really uh, since then from the Jungian perspective, from her own personal perspective. And as we got to talk, and uh, she's just a wealth of knowledge and wisdom, I thought, I really would like to record this and share it with you. So, uh, so we set up a time and, uh, and we did the recording, and this is it that I'd like to share with you. And, uh, and after that, I would like to uh, welcome your comments and uh, your reflections. So over to you, Rick, please uh, start the recording. Uh, we can't hear it, or rather, I can't hear it. I'll check the audio and be right back. Uh, okay. Thank you for your patience. Well, hello, dear Brenda. Thank you very much for agreeing to this um, discussion with me on Simone de Beauvoir's yeah. The Second Sex. Uh, so first, I'd like to uh, uh, quiz you about that. How did you feel? What were your um, thoughts and experiences when you first read the book? Well, I first read the book when I was an art student. And of course, I hadn't really met the world. I didn't meet the patriarchy in its worst sense. So the book was recommended to me by my Iranian boyfriend, oh. who came from a patriarchal uh, culture, though it was long before the uh, Islamic revolution in Iran. And uh, he said, this is a marvelous book. I said, oh, the second sex. And who is the second sex? He said, women. I said, oh, really? 
So I read the book and I thought, this is, this is really interesting, but where am I in this? Mm. The reason I say, where am I, is because uh, my own father was a patriarch, mm. but he was a benign patriarch. And of course, he had sons and daughters. Now, because he was an enormous character uh, and loved women and loved the feminine, all the women in the family became very, very strong. Mm. All the men were not so strong because his role model was so immense they couldn't meet it. Okay. So I was always used to knowing that this patriarchal man who loved the feminine and even made a garden for them. So all his daughters would come when they were married with their little baskets to cut flowers. He had a special garden for cut flowers. It was only for the women. Mm -hmm. The garden was only for the women. So I went to art school with this image in my mind. So there I discovered that uh, women were muses or people who inspired artists. And that didn't touch me awfully much. I thought, oh, well, fair enough. And it's flattering. Mm. So I finished my art school days. And of course, I hadn't uh, done anything in the world. I was still fairly innocent, but I went into the world. I applied for a job in an art school. And I got an interview. And the man interviewed me and there was a panel of different people, mostly men. Uh, and they said, this is a really, really good application and I had to bring a folder of work. And they were really impressed and they asked me about it and we discussed it. And then they asked me about art, what I liked, who I admired. And then suddenly the head of department said, this is such a good application that, you know, really we wanted a man. Just like that. And I was so astonished. I didn't know what to say. I said, oh. And then it happened again. I applied for a job in a gallery with very fine pictures. And the gallery owner took me around and asked me to uh, uh, give the history, the date, the technique, uh, um, the historical perspective. And I went around the gallery and I did that. And again, he said, oh, you're the best candidate we've had, but we really wanted a man. <laughs> so this happened twice. And then I thought, well, what's going on? And it's then that I realized what Simone de Beauvoir was speaking about, about the second sex. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's quite a big difference on the second sex in France and in England. In mm. England, a woman is a person. In France, a woman is a woman. She's not neuter. Mm. So France is very gendered. Mm. Well, it doesn't treat its women any worse or any better. It's just more gendered. And I was very conscious of that. And so um, more and more, I began to realize the cultural impact of patriarchy, which I didn't encounter until all the fun was over. I'd had a marvelous time at art school. Mm -hmm. My benign patriarch of a father wanted to give me everything, wanted to educate me. He, he wasn't... Uh, the image of the patriarchy that we have now, the mm. cultural image, he wasn't that. So he was very nourishing to the female sex. Mm. So this is a sort of overview of how the second sex came in. So then the next thing occurred, the next stage, because of course I was very young. And uh, so men often thought of me as their goddess figure or their muse or their anima 
uh, that it made me feel uncomfortable. That is, I was not a person. And that I discovered, however elevated they may put me up, that was oppressive. And uh, I remembered that uh, when I went to study Jungian psychology in Switzerland, I remember someone asking me, what did I really want to be? And without hesitation, I just said, what I'd really love to be is a real woman. <laughs> so all through my life, I've gone through all these stages. And of course, now I see more and more how important that book was. Mm. Because that was uh, written before most women were conscious that things were patriarchal or the culture was oriented towards the masculine, the rational. When I say masculine, I don't mean the man, but mm. of course it got identified with the man. Yeah. And then of course, when I studied Jung, I realized the masculine was also in women. I realized that because of my father, I had a powerful masculine. I'd uh, absorbed that from him. And so uh, throughout my youth, I had that drive, which I attribute, attributed to his uh, influence. So my search really was how to search out the feminine side. And so it was a lifelong search of balancing the two. But that book was seminal. I'm sure that if I read it again, I would find even more in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing this with me. Interesting enough, I, I had a very similar father, like he, he, my sister and I, he always considered us as persons, really. And uh, and when I went out to the big white bird, that's when I started to recognize that yeah, I am I am kind of not not peer you know, to a man or with a man. Uh, and uh, but anyway, a lot, what's let's go into the the other question that um, uh, the famous uh, uh, saying of uh, Beauvoir's book is one is not born but rather becomes a woman what does that mean to you and what does that mean from the Jungian perspective a Jungian perspective um, works in two ways first of all there's the cultural acknowledgement which is very similar to what de Beauvoir wrote and of course, Jung wrote about the change in role of women in Europe quite significantly. And he had a lot of uh, women followers and helpers. And he encouraged and supported them to write or to be other than, uh, shall we say, uh, amused to a man. He encouraged them to take on the fullness of their own life, however that was he didn't give a paradigm of what that should be and this is one really important thing about Jung's work there are no paradigms for how people should be mm. so individuation of a woman follows in a sense the search for the feminine core of the woman which is supported inwardly not outwardly inwardly by the masculine force so then uh, I would say that if you're studying Jungian psychology, you do go through the experience of realizing that your masculine aspect is on the top. That's what's helping you to function in the society. Because if the society is masculine oriented, that is, it's rational, it's in the light, uh, it doesn't like uh, to go into the dark, it wants things logical, then to get along in that society, you have to identify with it. And that's when the masculine gets out of control. Mm. So at that point, you realize that you have to begin to assess what it is about yourself that is feminine. 
And of course, by that stage, uh, what is feminine has got nothing to do with uh, being maternal, being soft and fluffy, wearing pink, uh, wearing high heels, uh, nail polish, looking like uh, a goddess. That's not the feminine in a woman. Yeah. The feminine is how the woman or myself needs to find an orientation in the world and in relation to it by not identifying with the common cultural masculine principle. And that is a real challenge because there are times when the masculine pushes you forward mm. and you have to notice that and say, is that your truth or your cultural habit? Exactly. So then you have to say, well, how would you respond as a woman? And gradually, gradually you begin to find through experience, not through anything logical or through the intellect, what the feeling is within when you respond as a woman through the feminine. Mm. And then gradually the masculine changes places and the feminine comes up and the masculine goes down. Mm. And from here, that supports you. So the masculine force in a woman is meant to support her femininity mm. rather than the other way. Mm. Can you, could so, you give us some example, maybe? Example of a masculine reaction. Yeah, how does the masculine support the feminine within? It's, it's a feeling sense. It's very difficult to describe uh, with the mind, but I'll have a go. <laughs> um, Say you uh, receive an email from someone who accuses you of something which is unjust. The immediate reaction of the masculine is to go bang and whack it back with a similar reply. That invites a, com uh, a conflict, mm. but it's not one of the healthier conflicts. It's called a reactive conflict, that it comes from an unreflective side of the personality. Yeah. So then what is the feminine reaction? Well, women are so deprived of the tune into the feminine that they often don't react immediately if they're thinking that way. And they'll wait for a long time for the reaction to die down, even if it's an unjust, accusation they still wait because this is part of the feminine work until the water stops moving and it's clear and you can find out what's going on in your heart mm. then you can reply now it doesn't mean the reply is going to be soft and sweet mm. it could be very tough mm. because uh, because of years and centuries of oppression the woman has become very tough. So then in finding that response, then you get the feeling that you have uh, responded as a feminine being and not as an honorary man. <laughs> wow, great. Thank you so much for the explanation. Um, if, I remember that uh, a couple of weeks ago when we, when we spoke, you mentioned to me uh, little story about Simone de Beauvoir when she was traveling on a train and there was a man sitting opposite to her. Could yeah, there's a man sitting next to her. Yeah. And of course, a man sits with his legs flayed out and a woman, her yeah. legs in. And naturally, a man takes more space. Hmm. So his thigh was touching hers. And she had a moment where she studied this touch of his thigh on her thigh. And what would she do? Would she have the instinctive movement which just did that and mm. moved her away from this warm thigh? Or would she sit there and reflect on what it felt like to just have that thigh touching? And from that, she could ga gauge what 
the conventional feminine reaction would be perhaps to go like that, to spring away, because men are not meant to touch women's thighs in public. So, uh, or would you think, well, no, I'm trying something new. I'm going mm -hmm. to experiment and leave my leg as it is mm. and, and watch what is happening inside myself. Mm. And so she would experiment like that. So she was uh, a woman of um, experiments, psychological experiments. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So the book was published uh, 70 years ago. In, in your observation, what has happened in 70, 70 years in terms of uh, gender equality or anything? I think one of the uh, awful predictions of Simone de Beauvoir has come true. She said that uh, when women began to struggle for equality, that uh, they would find a great resistance in the population, in men. That is not particularly a resistance to their freedoms, but a threat against themselves, that the woman would become the equal of the man. And this was a threat, a menace. And she said, in years to come, we're going to discover that there are going to be violent rapes mm. and um, some uh, effort to degrade the woman. And she said that she didn't think that the development would be possible without that stage. Mm. Uh, she foresaw that. I mean, you, you just have to look at India and what goes on in India to see that. You have to look at the constant stream of rapes. Of course, some of them are disclosed now, whereas they wouldn't be then. Yeah. But there does seem to be an air of violence and fear uh, concerning women. Mm. So mm. I, I think that um, prophetic side has come true. Mm. I think the other side, the equality that a woman can be a lawyer, uh, or a doctor and work uh, is also due to the women's liberation movement joining up with uh, the second sex. I don't know how Beauvoir envisaged that. So some of what happened to within the women's lib movement, which I feel was absolutely necessary, was that it unleashed the masculine aspect of the woman in order to fight the battles. Mm. And maybe that was necessary to get through a particular stage. Mm. So the militancy may have been necessary. Mm. But now, of course, um, that has to develop further so that the woman can really find not who she is collectively, that is a militant women's lib, but who she is also individually and the right to some self-determination, uh, the right to make decisions which are, uh, are, are her own without either referring to the man or to women's lib. Yeah. Yeah. And so this, I think, is the difficulty. Mm. And there we come up against uh, prejudices, against what it is that makes a woman free. Mm. So, for instance, uh, it was very common in England, in my analytic practice, for women to say, we've just had a baby. Oh, everyone thinks I should go back to work and take the child to the nursery or get a, a carer. I said, well, what do you want to do? She said, well, I want to stay at home with the child. I said, well, that's your freedom. See, see if that's possible. But she felt denied. So she had no freedom of choice. She had to prove that she was a woman in the world. So, of course, what's happened throughout the ages is that the most important task in the world of bringing a wholesome child into the world and 
allowing that child to grow as wholesomely as possible has been devalued. Mm. So if women choose that role, they think they're now devalued. Mm. So that's a side effect that has to be looked at. Mm. And then, of course, the women who want to be a lawyer, they receive the accolade that they're doing great things. Mm. So you really have to question, what is your freedom of choice as a woman? And what do you have to conform to, to prove that you're all singing and dancing? You're a woman, you can have a baby, you can have a job, you can do this, you can paint, you can do everything. And then you're exhausted. Yeah. So choosing is very difficult. Yeah. And it requires uh, inner reflection and contemplation about who you really are. Mm. And this is the most dynamic task of the woman. Who are you really when all this cultural baggage has been lifted from you? When all this stuff about being a muse or a goddess has been lifted from you, when mm. you're an ordinary human being who looks as much a mess in the morning as everyone else does, yeah. what is this fulfillment of that ordinary being? And, and that is a, a prime social task. So in order for the feminine to totally express itself, uh, it also has to relate to the feminine in the man. Mm. So when the feminine has been denigrated after years and centuries, it's not just women, it's in the man too. But unfortunately, women have borne the brunt of this. Mm. And history's given us awful examples. I mean, I read uh, when I was doing some research about uh, a Dominican monk called Giordano Brune, who died in 1600. Now he was burnt at the stake for heresy. And what was his heresy? He refused to declare that nature was inferior. Mm. Because in order to overcome paganism, the church uh, denigrated animals, denigrated nature, to try and remove the light of nature and put only the masculine spirit. And so everyone these days wants to transcend. But the feminine way is to go first into the darkness of nature and to find the light there. So this divine light of nature is neglected and the celestial light gets all the attention. Yeah, ah, true. Even women who are very liberated want to transcend and go up. Mm. But this is the masculine direction. I and see. of course, during these years, uh, and I'm sure that Simone de Beauvoir was conscious of what had happened uh, throughout the years. And she was aware of uh, the subtle alchemy between the masculine and the feminine mm. and the male and the female and the big difference between those. Because the male, of course, is the embodied man. But the masculine lives in both sexes. The woman is embodied, mm. but masculine and feminine lives in her too. And so they've often got mixed up. Mm. So Beauvoir often comments, but in a, a social cultural way on this um, denigration and uh, tying up really of women. Mm. Mm. Yeah. In England, as, as late as uh, 1940s or 50s, if a woman was a teacher or a civil servant, as soon as she got married, she had to give up the job. Hmm. I, w I wonder that what uh, Simone de Beauvoir would think about the Me Too movement. About the? The Me Too movement. Ah, yes. 
it's a uh, maybe she would want a more individual approach mm-hmm. yes me too means a common identity mm-hmm. you say something to me and i say me too mm-hmm. that is i identify with what you've said that's not a personal experiment mm. her personal experiment was relatedness because she was with uh, jean paul sartre the philosopher all her life yeah they never separated but they had an open marriage yeah. or rather they didn't marry they had an open relationship but they always came back together mm. they were inseparable really mm. yeah they were and uh, but, but i would like to direct our uh, discussion um now that uh, uh, just to really segue back to uh, to what you said yourself and Beauvoir said that uh, she didn't denote exactly or give like uh, like step by step this is this is how you become a woman and this is what it means to be a woman but you find your own essence and I really appreciate that and you said the, the same thing in uh, in different ways so in your view maybe based on your own experiences and uh, and uh, and the Jungian approach that um, how uh, <laughs> I know it's a, as you said it's a lifelong journey really. Mm-hmm. But could you could you give maybe just uh, some advices to to find these essences? What are the the ways to it and uh, and going through those 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 dark uh, dimensions as you said that not focusing on the transcending but more like the the other way around. I think, first of all, you have to have a real good look at your culture. Find out where you live, how you live and what's expected of you. Mm. And go from there, because the cultural pressure on a woman is terrible. You just have to look at uh, all the people who are facelifts to know that they're conforming to an image. So what does that mean, conforming to an image? Hmm. It's not that I have anything against facelifts. It's just that what does it mean that you conform to an image? And also that a a woman is to be perceived as ever young. Hmm. Is there no beauty in age? Yeah. So this cultural pressure on a woman, uh, which is not on a man, actually, to look good all the time, even, shall we say, with a partner who doesn't look after himself, is quite strong. Quite strong. And that, I think, is a, a terrible conflict for a woman to know that she has to adapt to an image. Mm. Mm. Okay, so you start with the culture, your own, your own culture first, and then? Well, if you, for instance, take the culture of Brazil. In Brazil, it's a very normal thing to have um, cosmetic surgery. And it's quite hard to resist it. But people do. Mm. So that's your cultural aspect. Mm. Now, you notice in Brazil, for instance, there's a very, very high incidence of domestic violence. The the woman is the man's possession to do what he likes. She can't even uh, deal with her own body. Mm. So uh, that's because the man has a fixed image of what the woman should be like. And she conforms to that fixed image. So when you've noticed your culture, notice then what your culture, what the image of your culture is of how a woman should behave and be. Mm. Have a good look at that. Don't shut it away. Just look at it. And then look at the suffering of the people who have totally conformed. Mm. What has happened to them on the inner level? Why must a woman always be a muse, an image, or a glamour girl? 
mm. and neglect the inner life. Mm. So th this is uh, a really big thing right. in all countries, sure. but especially in certain market, marked cultures, uh, Brazil, certain parts of the USA, um, England a little bit, France a little bit, European countries not so strong with the uh, facelifts and stuff, not so strong. And I think that's because they're probably more gendered. Mm -hmm. yes. And so it's more expected what they will look like in a few years. They still remain a woman. For instance, I'm an older woman. I go out of my door and next door there's a barber shop and there's a line of men and they lean on the door so I can't open it. Hmm. So I wriggle the, the knob a bit to let them know that someone's coming. As soon as I get to the door, they all spring back. They see it's a woman, an old one, and they sort of semi bow and they say, oh, bonjour, madame. Yeah. So I'm still a woman. So in certain cultures, only young women get looked at. Mm. Mm. That one is still treated as a woman in certain cultures. Mm. And it's not that it's a, a weakness, it's just um, a certain sort of courtesy, which mm. is uh, given to women of a certain age. Mm. So in fact, there's a little more respect. Yeah. Yeah, it is. That's true. But of course, I'm not living in a big city. I'm living in a, a traditional town. So you see the vestiges of a, a courtly system, really. Mm. But they, they're young people with Mohicans and funny haircuts. Uh, they're not, you know, and they're all like that. Suddenly they turn into uh, princes and bow and say this greeting. Yeah. Well, this is a gendered society. Yeah. It's very pleasant. Mm. Or it can be, yeah, absolutely. There's actually one, one more thing I'd like to uh, share with you because uh, the last uh, few days I've been researching that who says what about the, the, the legacy or the influence of Simone de Beauvoir in, in our world today. And I found a, a, a very uh, interesting article by a PhD student who looked at a, a specific aspect, which is during this pandemic, what's happened to women and she was really discussing that through through her own lenses and uh, and experiences and saying that it was yet again the women who who suffered so much more than uh, than men because they mm -hmm. had to look after the children the homeschooling the looking after the mm -hmm. man as well in case if he gets ill as well then she has to do even even more than that and so yet again it was done on on the on the women and i just thought wow that's really really a good point of view what's what is what is your take take on it that what you experienced that uh, in the pandemic the how how did women got uh, got treated or or uh, or maybe oppressed further uh, i may say um yes i think it's possible that um the surface of the society looks as though it's free that is the woman goes out to work she has a childminder uh, the man goes out to work life goes on all that disappears. No one can have a child mind or if there's a COVID epidemic. So what happens is that there's a kind of internal collapse and the woman receives what she had centuries ago. That is, things have not changed as much as we think. Yeah. And there's been an implosion. Mm. So what's happened there, as I see it, is that the masculine and the feminine have not come together in both parties well enough. That is that the uh, feminine aspect of the man has not offered the nurturing aspect to help the woman. And the woman may not have demanded the masculine aspect to support her, but got used to being independent 
which isn't really how families operate. They're a unit. So if the family is not operating from a sincere structure and base of a unity, then everything falls into chaos. The male and female separate and it's just a suffering. Yeah, thank, thank you, Brenda. Well, um, before we uh, finish off, I'd like to ask you what would be your final words to uh, to women and maybe to uh, to to men? What would be your 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 message or advice or recommendation or sure. any uh, The thing is, women are different to men. I'm not in favor of a neuter aspect. So women are going to behave different to men. And within the women, all the women are going to be different from each other. Mm. The thing that is most difficult for a woman, I think, is to resist the pressure of being the natural carer in the family or of other people, of friends, and act true to herself and care from the heart and not from an obligation. And this is worlds apart. If you care from the heart, you get energy. If you care from obligation, it drains you. So in order to sustain the feminine, the, one, the woman needs to know herself and how she is and what she needs to resist and where she needs to give way and not have a paradigm of how one should behave. And if you can hold to that, of course, you can't do it immediately. It comes little by little because it's like a seed. It has to take root. So if you go all out or singing and dancing, then it pulls up the roots. If you start reflectively and say, no, hang about, I, I, I think that uh, I said yes there, but I think really if i'm reflective i should have said no that's the step towards awareness even if you didn't do it afterwards you've got the feeling of what you might have done that's how it begins and then the next time you remember your psyche remembers even if you forget <laughs> and out comes the effort for the next go and you say i've thought about it but um no <laughs> so in this process you need a lot of humor you need a lot of humanity with yourself it's very difficult to give humanity to others if you have none for yourself yeah. and this is what the world needs above all it needs uh, genuine love and care and humanity and these are cultivated they don't come so easily and we all have difficulties. If we can all understand that, we can work together. So that would also be my thought for the world, that that is a possibility. And that the communities we live in can be different. Mm -hmm. Because of the individual work we do, and the respect that each of us uh, gains for doing that. Thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you so much for talking. Uh, with me or uh, you you were doing most of the talking which i wanted anyway because I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted to hear your 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 wisdom uh and knowledge uh yeah my greatest gratitude to you thank you so much it's my pleasure georgie thank you very much rick for playing the uh, the recording and thank you to uh to brenda who is uh with us today uh, but first i'd like to uh um ask jim for your reflections and observations thank you georgie uh and thank you brenda what a marvelous uh, dialogue between the two of you it, it felt to me to be deeply wise about uh, one of the most complex um mysteries that we humans have to deal with. We're all human, but the, the epistemic difference between male and female has been a challenge from our inception. And it, it continues to 
um, be a real conundrum, uh, who we are, what our identities are. Uh, and two things come to mind, uh, Georgie, as I was thinking about it and reflecting on Simone de Beauvoir and, and uh, Brenda's points. Uh, you know, one thing just as a comment is around the emerging gender and sexual fluidity hmm. that is characterizing, I think, the transformation of the male and the female, as well as the masculine and the feminine. Uh, and, uh, you know, it wasn't so apparent, you know, 70 years ago, but I think it's it's burgeoning around the world. And so I think there's some evolutionary uh, imperative uh, that is going on uh, that I think is worth noting that the classical yin yang, masculine, feminine may not be so true. It may be that when we really liberate ourselves from the yoke of patriarchy, we may discover that we, we thought was the masculine impulse and what we thought was the feminine. In a Jungian term, I'm talking about Jung as someone who did his PhD in Jungian psychology, uh, may not be the final say in actually what the masculine and feminine are and what male and female are. So I just want to offer that. And then the second comment I want to make is um, I hadn't taken in uh, that uh, uh, Simone de Beauvoir had uh, kind of predicted this reactive repression of the feminine, which we see, uh, you know, around the world. And I think most explicitly right now in the United States, you know, the most liberated where the women really birth modern liberation here and in Europe and the United States at uh, the reaction. They're now even closing down on the woman's right to her body. In, in Texas, they've got bounties on, uh, $10,000 bounties on women. And um, uh, But what the, the point that I wanted to make is that in and through this, my view is that it's time for women to actually be in leadership uh, in ways that, that in some fundamental sense are an inversion of the classic model. Uh, and, and, and that goes back to my first point. I, I think that what's up for women, in my view, is a much more fuller exploration of the yang energy, the masculine energy. And for men, I think it's a much more deep exploration of the classic notion of the yin energy. And I think that if it may be that rather than the yin and the yang with yang yin and a little dot on each side, it may be that when the women fully come into their yang energy, their masculine energy, and the men fully come into their yin and feminine energy, I think that we will experience uh, a, a new Tao that has not yet been discovered. So uh, I, I, I believe that, that what is being broken through right now are all the classic formulations of male and female and masculine and feminine. And so I just want to open that up to everybody's collective attention uh, that, that uh, we are only at the beginning of the wondrousness of a post-patriarchal world in which all these neat little categories I think are being shattered. And a uh, hundred years from now, I think they'll look back uh, on the way we're currently formulating the masculine and feminine at, like we look back at the medieval period. 
uh, and um, uh, I think it's a wonderful place to be as we break all this this open. So anyway, I, that's what was coming up for me. And um, you know, for example, we're doing a whole week on humanity rising in the spring on entering the world of trans. And we're having men who've become women and women who've become men for a whole week talk about trans. What is trans? And what does gender and sexuality mean in a world of trans? Just as a harbinger of the, 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 the delicacies on this feast of masculine and feminine that still await us if the human race would just open up enough to, uh, to explore that which we were at the beginning and we will be soon if we would just lighten up a bit. <laughs> so that's all I would say, Georgie. Thanks so much. And I'd yeah, love well, to hear your comment and even Brenda's comment. If, uh, she no, yeah, that. I'd like to bring, bring her in. It's so interesting that this is the second time uh, I watched our interview or rather when she was talking, which I wanted so much because I, every single time I, I talk with her, I learned so much uh, from her. And it's interesting that this is such a 360 degrees of uh, uh, like, different direction you can you can go to and what I really wanted to focus at this session is that what what her book really means means to you because what you just shared with us is 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 different to to what maybe arose in me and the way uh, Brenda and I we were talking it was really it wasn't like a, a prescripted uh, a discussion it just we just left it uh, organically and uh, and it could it could it could really go in in different uh, di, uh, directions um, um, I what I'd like to actually go into our um, I don't know first of all I'd like to ask Brenda if she has any any comment on on James uh, uh, reflections Rick would you mind to um, I tried to promote her, Georgie, and she asked me not to. I'll try it again. Oh, okay. Uh, she's rejoining. She'll join us in a second. All right, wonderful. There we go. Hello, dear Brenda. You're Thank muted, you. Brenda. Can yeah. you hear me now? Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you very much again for the uh, for our discussion and thank you very much for attending today. I uh, really, really appreciate uh, your your time. Um, would you would you have any uh, any comments on on James um, reflections? Um, possibly the comment would be um, about the male and female gender aspect. Um, which Jim was opening up, basically. Um, but there's also the other intrapsychic level. Uh, the masculine and feminine, of course, are on the intrapsychic level. Mm. So when we talk about uh, the masculine of the woman, it's the intrapsychic level. And the feminine of the man, the intrapsychic level. And uh, how far these can relate or merge and that i'm not sure of uh, as, as jim was saying it how, did you have that um double entendre you could say of an intrapsychic level and a gendered male and female how are you relating that well i've had a, a several conversations very deep conversations long conversations for example with uh, donovan ackley um, uh, who was born with both male and female genitalia. He spent the first 40 years of his life as a woman, gave birth to two children, and then transitioned to being a male who he thought he always was, but wasn't allowed to be by his uh, parents, and is now a full, full man. And so his notion, uh, Brenda, of what even the sex is and what gender is kind of blew my mind because I'd never spoken to someone who was both at birth, had deeply experienced the feminine, 
given birth to two children as a woman and then transitioned to become a man. And so his take on masculine and feminine in his world, there isn't sharp distinctions hmm. like there is in ours. And I think that's the point that's coming to me as I really delve into this domain that, that it may end up being that we're all highly individuated and each one of us has a particular relationship between gender and sexuality and these cosmic principles that the more the cultural overlay is taken off as you keep uh, challenging us to do, uh, the more uh, we're gonna get into uh, a, a wondrous world <laughs> that yes, we currently I, I don't see, know exists. <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. And uh, I can go along with that because the um, cultural stereotypes of uh, male, yeah. female, etc., cetera, are, are very um, destructive to the individual. And yet the individual has to find some way of relating to the whole, otherwise we're all split. Yeah. So it, it's this problem. And um, I think it's possible that we don't need to identify with each other to create a whole, we need to relate to each other. I think there's a, a marvelous image, it's called Indra's net, and it's a net of the universe and where each uh, crisscross of the net occurs, there's a jewel. And that jewel shines into every other jewel and it becomes one big light. But each jewel is absolutely independently and individually exactly. developed. Yeah. And so what you've got is relatedness within this net of the whole rather than just a collective light, a mishmash. So uh, that's how I would see the individual contribution to the whole. So the whole relatedness of, of the planet and the universe, in fact. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. And also, if I may refer back to Simone de Beauvoir and what she said in, in her book, it is that you, you put the meaning, the definition, the essence into what gender or whatever kind of gender you are identify with, right? So she always said that it's uh, what you said, Brenda, so it's cultural connection. It's all, all about that. It's all about con condition, really. Hmm. And I'd like to refer back to some of the comments that appear in the chat book and uh, would like to see if uh, any of you would like to have a comment First of all, it's one from Cindy saying that did the devaluing of child rearing contribute to devaluing of teachers? And also she commented, um, uh, about the yin and yang into it, I mentioned very, yeah, Jonathan saying, don't forget that each half of the yin and yang contains a small circle of the opposite color. That's interesting. And also some comments from Leo Jacobi, who is using Jungian psychology in mentoring youth and young adults to become conscious first of the personhood with both masculine and feminine capacities? Then the examination of dominant culture and historical norm and how to negotiate one's unique balance of masculine and feminine agency in one's particular culture. Are we too quick to identify as some kind of gendered human bypassing the work of appropriating full masculine and feminine personhood and often prescinding any cultural analysis? Yes. That's what we have been uh, discussing. And thank you very much for the link you posted, Leo. Um, just, just really, uh, does inversion of the classic model simply perpetuate the dualistic yin and yang model with reversed colors? Brenda's comment on unit and unity of family may be a path beyond dualistic and often adversarial relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful comments. Um, do and, and would any Cindy, Leo, or or Crystal, any any of our uh, dear attendees would like to come in and ask ask question from um, or just comment maybe on on Brenda's uh, thoughts or Jim? Do you want to say something because you look like it? No. 
No, I was just going to add that, that one point that is worth just noting about us humans is that we've got, you know, the 22 chromosomes are all the same. The sexual part is just one little X and Y differential at the top. And uh, that's actually comforting that we're 99.9% .9 the same, but that one XY <laughs> there is also the great divide. And, you know, as a Jungian, Brenda, I'm sure that's a, that's a delicious conundrum and paradox to think about how you can be so similar and yet so different simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And the, the tiniest thing makes us different. Yeah, the, the tiniest, tiniest thing. thing. So <laughs> we tend to put a value on the greater part, but sometimes we need to put a value on the tiny part. Yeah. Because <laughs> that is like a little seed. Yeah. It is. Well, we have Krista. She's, uh, she put her hand up. So uh, let's hear from Krista. Her, her mic is open, Georgie. Thank you so much, Rick. Hello, thank you so much for um, today's presentation and the dialogue. I've been working um, with this idea that it was not only the land that was colonized, it was also our hearts, our minds, our philosophy, our language, and archetypes. And so I've been working with how do we decolonize those things? I think you know, we've spent a lot of time in Western culture looking at the impact of the land being colonized, but we haven't spent a lot of time on everything else that was also colonized. And how do we expand archetypes? And I see what Jim was sharing in terms of trans and gender as an example of that. Uh, of the kind of work. And, and that's one of the things that needs to be done, but that, even that is embedded in a colonized language and set of archetypes. And how does that shift? And I think it, it shifts with these um, grassroots movements that create new language, right? And how that moves into the masses, but then how does that feed into um, academia and our studies. What is the relationship? You know, do we identify with each other? How do we relate um, uh, academia with the masses? And I feel like even the divide that existed there is starting to break down. Um, I read things in mass media every day about the Vegas nerve now about neuroscience. Uh, things that used to just be hosted and kind of segmented off as the people who are educated studied those things. And now all of it's available to the world. So I just find myself um, playing with that as I'm listening to this conversation and thinking about young and archetypes. And I'm also a soul collage facilitator. And that gives the opportunity for us to do the work Brenda was describing with exploring each of our individual essences. Um, so that's my response to today. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Krista. Well, it, as, as Jim referred to, and we all feel that we are going through a, a massive amount of uh, transition and uh, transformation and I think so much need to be discovered about uh, who we are and who we want to be and how we want to be <laughs> so uh, keep on keep on with these uh, questions um, uh, Crystal and, and and maybe you have some answers to some of your questions already do you the only answer I have is that I think it all has to expand to be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hear. And that's what gives me a lot of hope is that's what I heard both um, Jim and Brenda saying today, that we have to expand to include the variety of who we are. And I especially appreciated um, Brenda's distinction between we don't have to identify with everyone, but we need to relate. So, because I think our colonized definition of identifying still carries that idea of sameness. 
And I think that's one of the things that um, requires work is mm -hmm. I don't have to limit my, I, my relationships to people who are the same beings who are the same. I can have interspecies relationships that are every much as meaningful as a relationship with another human being. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. Well, to me, absolutely, it makes uh, a, lo a lot of sense. Also about just expanding and accepting the, the maybe uh, our differences. There is another word I would like to use is respect. Is just because somebody is tiny bit or maybe a little bit more different to me, then I just respect that person. That that's who that person person is, right? So uh, I think that there's a lot of respect there is 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 missing with the acceptance and compassion. Lots of lots of other <laughs> words like that, really. Uh, Brenda, do you have any comments on Crystal's uh, points of views? Possibly the uh, expansiveness that she was referring to. And uh, we know that the universe expands as we're sitting here. It's just going on and bigger and bigger. Um, and we have in a way to do that. And if you take... Um, that very uh, possibly outmoded, well, no, but still useful saying, uh, love your enemies. Think of the work that you have to do to extend yourself to love an enemy. It's immense. So that task alone uh, is going to extend the whole universe of humanity. Because now people go, as uh, Crystal said, uh, where you have a group, where there's a group interest or identity, it's quite easy to have relatedness. But the very hard work that you have to uh, do with people who you don't understand is incredible. And this is what actually extends our souls. Once our souls are expanded, if you, you could say we meet the world self. And what happens when we meet the world self? Well, we can only think that something immense happens. And so for me, it's um, all these things have to be experienced. So this is why I say that Jung has no paradigm. There's no frame that he places on reality. It's, it's open to the individual and through the individual and the expansion of the individual to extends and extends and extends. Does that make sense, Crystal? Very much. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Crystal. And thank you, Brenda, as well, for your comments. Now, there is a comment from Cindy. Relating feels like a journey toward greater empathy through witnessing rather than judging. Thank you. And then Susu says, did our state of mind reach the state to allow women to act like women in higher positions without being criticized? <laughs> well, clearly no. <laughs> and then there's a question from Leo, is Marx or Jung or Sartre the more significant influence on Beauvoir's philosophy? Well, definitely, clearly Sartre, because uh, from university years, uh, they you know, they were like uh, intellectual companions. Um, it is certainly true that Marx was a far greater influence than Jung. Yeah, maybe so, I, I, I don't know. I saw so definitely Marx, yeah, I don't, I can't really put a, uh, a percentage of it uh, for sure. But uh, why, why, why is that uh, a question, Leo, actually? That in terms of influence, is it because of uh, the, uh, the the gender aspect to Marx, Jung, or uh, Sartre? Uh, I, I cited the um, interview with Beauvoir 25 years after uh, this uh, second sex, 1976, and yeah. she emphasizes in that interview the class struggle as having a higher priority. She mentioned. Um, a strike by a factory workers in France, mostly women. And at first the men were very supportive and brought food to the factory for the strikers. 
but when the strike turned to have to be uh, 24 seven <laughs> and the men objected that you could only strike in the daytime, but you have to come home at night. <laughs> and so there was a resistance by yeah. the men to, uh, you know, mm. striking was one thing, but uh, you had to stay within the dominant um, aspect mm. of being the woman at home. So uh, it seemed that the class, <laughs> the Marxist and class struggle uh, had priority in Beauvoir's uh, reflection 25 years later. Mm -hmm. And but I thought, Brenda, your uh, contribution of bringing in Jung is, is very important for appropriating Beauvoir and uh, I think quite relevant. So I, it's a toss up in my mind <laughs> which, no. which, which way I go. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's that's the that was my intuition as well that I really wanted to bring in in Brenda and her wealth of knowledge and uh, and wisdom just to share the different uh, aspect and light on uh, what what uh, Beauvoir means uh, Beauvoir's work mean means to us now and uh, and and really that uh, what is the now and how do we go from from here to uh, to the to the, to the future in co-creating uh, <laughs> for a better world really but uh, we have only a few minutes left so um, I think that at this stage I'd like to pass the word back to Jim and um, finish off uh, for uh, for this year the great books uh, course and i thank you so much for all the um attendees and brenda and rick for the tech facilitation you're a star so uh, over to you jim thank you georgie uh and i just must say just as we conclude this this year you know you're a true intellectual in the finest european tradition uh, I just want to acknowledge that. Wouldn't you agree, Brenda? Yeah. Georgie is Definitely a true intellectual. Definitely she's got the European <laughs> touch. Yes. <laughs> the way you have parsed uh, Simone de Beauvoir has been just uh, magnificent. I, so I just want to thank you for it and honor uh, your erudition <laughs> and uh, scholarship, you know, in this manner. And uh, mm -hmm. the other thing I just want to say, uh, just as we close, and then I'll say something about the uh, what's coming up next year for great books. I deeply believe that with all the repression and all the palava around women going on in the world today, it is time for the women to lead. And I believe, I it's, a, <laughs> I believe it's a national security issue. I think it's a matter of existential human importance that leadership as much as possible everywhere around the world needs to be turned over to women uh, immediately and without uh, hesitation uh, till at least 2030, uh, maybe to the end of the 21st century. Uh, because I think we men have made such a hash of it. <laughs> and patriarchy has been so uh, destructively coercive that we need a kind of a radical transposition of gender and sexuality and that the simplest and most direct way to do that is to put women in the leadership and by the way that's what jim hickman and i are doing as the the founders of ubiquity university we've been at the helm for a long time and we're now in a major transition and um, uh, um, you know starting in the new year um, uh, women are going to be leading ubiquity uh, into the future uh, and I don't have anything against men. Uh, some men are some of my best friends, uh, but I really believe deeply politically, philosophically, uh, and most importantly, historically, that it's time for women to be placed in the leadership. And so we're going to model that at Ubiquity. Uh, most of the women on the executive team are women, and we're now setting up an executive function um, uh, that is all women. Uh, and I think men now need to really explore the deeper dimensions of yin. And I think it'll be a profoundly illuminating experience for us all. So uh, this has been a wonderful book with which to end 2021, uh, Georgie. So thank you for that, because the synchronicity in terms of my transition 
uh, after 16 years as uh, the chief executive is, uh, is exquisitely synergistic. Uh, so we owe one to Simone de Beauvoir on this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then next year, everyone, we're, we're gonna have a, another a great year. Um, uh, although next year, in contradistinction with 2021, where we took a break in the summer, we're not gonna do that next year. We're just gonna have um, uh, uh, a session every month um, for the 12 months. So we'll be covering six books. Uh, Georgie and I will be back. Uh, Thomas Hubel uh, will be doing The Tao Te Ching. Uh, Carolyn Baker uh, will be doing uh, something. Um, uh, Constantina Clark uh, will be uh, doing something. And just to give you a sense of how wide open, it's going to take an extra minute, but this is a fascinating story. Constantina, who some of you may know is our former Dean of Students, who's coming back with us beginning in the new year. Um, about a year ago, she had a debilitating disease, at the end of which they discovered that they had some she had some bone marrow problem. The solution for which is she had to get rid of all of her blood, bring in the blood of another human being to replenish her, and it changed her DNA. And because she's Irish and Greek, uh, I, yeah, Irish and Greek, it was very hard to find anybody that would do that kind of transplant, bone transplant. And the only one that was available was one of her daughters. So her daughter gave, the, gave her the blood. And I asked Constantina when she was, I said, so how did it change your personality? Because you know that there was some heart, people that have heart transplants, they start to take on the characteristics of the old person's heart. And she said, well, I've had this passion for Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> and it turns out her daughter is a, is a passionate Stoic. So Constantina is gonna do a, 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 a couple of lectures on the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. And then we're, we're working on a PhD with Thomas Hubel and Georgie had the, the bright idea, why don't we ask Thomas uh, to do his favorite book. And his favorite book is the Tao Te Ching. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a, a wonderful year. Um, uh, Georgie's going to do Montaigne's essays. I, I think I'm going to do uh, Freud's Civilizations and its Discontents. And, uh, and Brenda, I know you have a course coming up, right? Mm -hmm. Aren't you doing yeah, so I have um, four okay. on alchemy. Alchemy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The yeah. um, resurgence of the feminine. It's about yeah, yeah, yeah. going you into know, the. Feminine. Everyone, Brenda's course on the I Ching last year was one of our top ten most participated in. But all your the YouTube, the recordings were 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 uh, the uh, among the top viewed recordings of all our courses last year, Brenda. I don't know whether you knew that. Oh, I didn't know, but that's heartwarming. <laughs> I feel very warm in the heart. Thank you. So uh, I think everyone's going to look forward to your uh, work, uh, your your course on uh, alchemy. So anyway, that brings us to a close, everyone. I want to thank all of you. It's been an eventful year. Thank you for going the distance of a year that's going to be considered epic in human history as we look back on the pandemic, on climate uh, change and code red and, and all of that. And uh, nothing is more important to us than you as our community. So I just wanna honor all of you uh, participants that have been uh, present with our course. This, this community of ours is, is what sees us through. Uh, so I wanna honor you and thank you. I wanna wish everybody the happiest of holidays. It's the time of the year where we go into hearth and home, and then we'll see you on the other side in January for 2022, uh, which uh, hopefully will be much more abundant uh, and much more inviting to the kind of creativity that needs to characterize us uh, as a human family as we try to build a future 
worthy of our children. So thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. And Georgie, thank you. Brenda, thank you. Really, thank really you. good discussion today. Everyone. Thank you. Bye for Bye -bye. now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.